Biology, and Director of the Research Corps here at Harvard. Luis Ivers is an Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine here at HMS, and Executive Director of the Center for Global Health at MGH. Vanessa Curry is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Physician at MGH, Director of the Program in Global Policy and Social Change in our department, and Founder and CEO of Seed Health. And Paul Farmer is, well, Paul Farmer, Nicola Catroni's University Professor at Harvard, the Co-Founder and Chief Strategist at Partners in Health, Chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham, and Chair of our department. Dr. Murray, Dr. Ivers, and Dr. Farmer are also specially trained in infectious diseases, while Dr. Curry is so specially trained in critical care medicine, and they each bring rich social perspectives to such biomedical backgrounds. Dr. Murray will start off speaking on where we're at concerning the epidemiology of COVID-19 to date and the evaluation of treatments and responses to it thus far. She'll be followed by Dr. Ivers, who will discuss the critical and to this point largely unaddressed concerns over why and where and how this pandemic will reinforce existing inequalities. She'll in turn be followed by Dr. Curry, who will discuss how health security is individual, community, and national security, and how we have the opportunity in a pandemic response to invest in longer-term resilience that outweighs the pandemic. And she'll be followed by Dr. Farmer, who will serve as a discussant relating the themes and tensions evinced by Drs. Murray, Ivers, and Curry to themes, tensions, and lessons learned from prior pandemics, which he and so many of you and your colleagues have been on the front lines. Each of our speakers will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll then have time for Q&A. So definitely listen carefully now, as this is the first time we're doing this as a department. Audience members can submit questions anytime to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll, I'll sort through those and select several for our speakers at the end. If you can remember, please write your name after your question, as sometimes Zoom may substitute a phone number for a name in the submitted metadata. Try not to use the chat function to submit questions, as I'll be focusing on the Q&A stream. And definitely have a good sense of humor and patience, given I've been left in charge of a technologically dependent process. Unfortunately, Carol Benoit, Jen Pusetti, and Megan Carroll are here to help as well. So we'll start off with Megan. Great, thank you, Scott. That was so so uh, such a nice introduction. Um, I'm going to go very quickly because I want to start um, by presenting some some material that you you almost all are a little bit familiar with, and then move into a discussion of how modelers and so infectious disease transmission modelers and dynamic modelers kind of see this universe. Because I'm sure you're seeing a lot of input from them, and it's hard to evaluate. And then end really um, briefly by talking a little bit about what's going to be different and what is different in low and middle income countries than what we're seeing in these high income countries where um, we've seen most of the, uh, the action so far. So, so you will have seen this graph um, that I'm starting with. Um, this is the uh, a curve that uh, is, was put out by uh, the Chinese for Wuhan. As you almost certainly know, there was an introduction probably from an animal vector sometime probably in November in this area. We don't actually know what the animal was that, that led to, uh, and, and how, what kind of interaction led to this um, outbreak. But ultimately, the closest genome uh, from, a, from an animal coronavirus to the coronavirus that is now spreading came from bats. And this was tip also true of um, SARS-1, it's also true of Nipah virus and others, probably Ebola as well, that bats harbor a, a, a whole series of, of um, viral uh, diseases that don't cause disease in bats, uh, but do get into other animals um, that are uh, intermediary hosts. In this case, unclear, which was the intermediary host, snakes, well, snakes do eat bats, uh, um, uh, civet cats, and this uh, scaly anteater that uh, is used um, for traditional medicine and very heavily marketed in, in China. So we don't know how it happened, but somehow uh, this, this early step led to person-to-person -person transmission um, that started in December. It wasn't really picked up until about late December, uh, early January. You've certainly heard all the discussion about when who, who knew what, when, and what they should have done about it. But suffice to say that the numbers um, that you've just seen went up dramatically uh, in January, 
and then um, and continued to rise uh, until very drastic social distancing, quarantine, and isolation measures were taken in Wuhan. And, and then the, the epidemic fell off quite abruptly. Um, what we don't know is, is how many people were infected during that outbreak because most infections or many infections go undetected. So we don't know what proportion of the population is now immune. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So what is it? I mean, you um, see it all the time. It's an RNA virus. Uh, it's, uh, viruses are fairly simple things. Um, they consist of an outer membrane um, some, and a couple of proteins. And in this case, the protein that we're interested in is this spike protein, the red thing on this picture, which is what um, it binds to the receptor on humans. The receptor is the ACE2 receptor, which is the um, uh, a, a receptor that is in many cells in the body, but particularly in the respiratory tract. And uh, this is also the target of vaccines that would be developed and also antibodies that, that um, uh, provoke an immune response. So it turns out that, that this coronavirus is one of a big family of beta coronaviruses. There are many, many. Um, they're very well known as, as animal diseases. Um, they cause gastrointestinal disease in animals. There's, there's a porcine coronavirus that really wipes out a uh, whole um, farms of, um, of pigs, uh, but it also has caused a number of respiratory tract diseases in humans. It's responsible for some of the, the colds that you see, but they are quite distantly related to this particular beta coronavirus. So this is not a cold virus. Uh, and, and also is more closely related to the three that you've certainly heard of, SARS-1 that happened in 2002, 2003, and then the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus that is still um, circulating, but uh, had a very high mortality, which came from camels, but, but originally from bats, and now, now this virus. So um, you've also almost about the clinical features. People usually present with a low-grade fever, a cough, a fatigue, sputum production, shortness of breath, really very similar to flu-like syndrome. Uh, there's a couple of distinguishing characteristics that people ask about very often. What about runny nose? We're in allergy season at the moment, and so people are often um, uh, finding themselves with these kinds of symptoms and not knowing whether they're COVID symptoms or allergy symptoms. Nasal congestion and, and allergy type symptoms are rare, about 5% of people, although they seem to be rising, um, and that might be just because we're going into allergy season and they're concurrent. Um, there's some GI symptoms in a small proportion of people. But again, I'm seeing that those numbers are increasing uh, as the disease, uh, the infection circulates in the US population. Um, the incubation period is the time from exposure until the onset of disease. And that averages about four to five days, uh, although it can range from as little as one day to up to 14 days. And there are some cases that have been reported even later than that. So there's, there's people who look like they were infected 28 days earlier and didn't get sick for almost a month. But they're fairly rare and they're, they're outliers. Um, but most people who have detected disease end up with uh, abnormalities in their lungs, uh, even when they're not symptomatic. And those are observable on chest CT, but not necessarily chest X-ray. So in China, uh, when um, diagnosis was difficult because of the lack of um, testing for the, the PCR, people turned to CT diagnoses. Um, and it turns out that there were, 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 they have more access to uh, innovative technologies that could do CTs. So, so uh, mobile CTs that were in backpacks that could be used um, outside of facilities. The age distribution is also really well known. So this is the age distribution, not of death, but of infection, uh, although by, by, by infection, I mean symptomatic infection. So there's very few cases of symptomatic infection that occurred in under 10-year-olds, um, relatively few in 10 to 19-year-olds, and then that number goes way up uh, to 30 to 79-year-olds are most of the cases. And in this case, the, the greater than 80-year-olds really reflects the population distribution in China, where this was a study, which just means that there are not that many 80-year-olds in the population. Uh, so this is really just the age distribution of people presenting. Um, but if you look at who dies, or who, and which is a, in, in, in a proxy for who gets very sick, you see that it really does increase dramatically with age and very consistently. 
But I like this particular um, graphic because uh, some of them, you know, standardize these these numbers so that it looks like 100% of 80 year olds die. But of course, that's not true. About um, somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of people who presented with symptomatic disease in that age group die. And that goes down um, so that the numbers under, say, um, 50 are much lower. This is data from Wuhan. Um, and that's, uh, th th we're seeing different numbers in different places. So we're seeing a very high case fatality rate. Uh, it was similar to this, but a little bit higher in, in Italy, where a lot of elderly people are affected. But also we've seen deaths in young, younger people often healthcare workers. And although we don't understand why those healthcare workers, the younger ones, are particularly likely to die, it probably has to do with the, the um, dose of the exposure that they're really, when they're intubating patients or working directly with patients or working with lots of different patients, they're really getting a bigger dose to their, um, either to their, directly to their lungs or, or through the respiratory tract. And that might have an effect, although it hasn't been well documented. In terms of, we've heard a lot about it's it's people who are sick in in um, who get who die, and uh, that's probably true. Uh, although these numbers that I'm showing you, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, uh, and diabetes, they all move together. So lots of people with cardiovascular disease also have diabetes, and they also have hypertension. So it's hard to say which one of these is responsible. But what's, I think, consistent, and, and this is coming out of some of the uh, more recent basic science on, in, in this um, field, is that when people die, it's from an inflammatory, a sort of a hyper-inflammatory response that causes acute respiratory distress syndrome. And it looks like people who have a kind of metabolic inflammatory profile are those at most risk. So we think of people with um, elderly people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes as being in a hypermetabolic state that causes kind of a chronic inflammatory um, uh, disease. And it, it seems that they are the most likely to develop very serious uh, uh, lung um, cytokine responses that, that are like a cytokine storm. And those are more often men than women. Cardiovascular disease is more common in men than women, so it's hard to know if that's making up for it. Men also in most of the world smoke more than women do, and smoking is also a, a strong risk factor for who gets disease. There's been a lot of discussion about what is the true case fatality rate, and um, it's a, become a political football uh, with whether um, our president is right in thinking it's less than 1% or others are right in thinking it's much higher than that. Uh, one of the difficulties in estimating the case fatality rate is that at the beginning of an epidemic, we really see the sickest people. And so it depends what we think we're, we're, we're when we count a, a case fatality rate, we're counting the number of people who die over the denominator of the number of people with a disease. In this case, we don't even know who has this disease. So uh, because many, many cases are undetected, some of those people who are undetected will actually be sick and just not come to clinical attention and others will be asymptomatic. But since they're not being counted in the denominator, we really don't know what the case fatality rate is. Usually as the less sick people get counted, then the case fatality rate tends to go down over time. And this is true for any epidemic. And that's what you're seeing in this graph, which is um, showing you the case fatality rate over time in Wuhan and other parts of China. But there's another type of bias that's common in estimating case fatality rates, which is that if you take it at any particular time, like in the course of this process, and you count up the number of people who have died and put in, in the denominator all the people that you know of who have, have the infection, then you're, some of the people who have the infection now will go on to die in the future, and you're not counting them as deaths. So that tends to have the other bias in, in underestimating the case fatality rate. So the moral of the story is it's really very challenging to actually say what the case fatality rate is and that we will, at the end of the epidemic, uh, hopefully soon, um, uh, we will know, but we will probably will not know until then. And we also expect it to vary quite dramatically in different populations based on the, the underlying distribution of, of vulnerabilities, which I'll come to. So you probably also know, um, have heard from the radio and else, uh, to TV, et cetera, about um, how this is diagnosed. 
Uh, the gold standard is to use uh, RT-PCR, so that is um, uh, for for the because this is an RNA virus, that's a two-step process, where one you turn use a reverse transcriptase to turn this turn the RNA into a DNA molecule, and then you sequence the DNA molecule or you sequence parts of it using PCR. Um, most labs can do that. Most high, you know, high, uh, high high performance molecular labs in hospitals like the ones in Boston. But um, in this particular case, uh, hospitals were not allowed to use their own testing at the beginning. They were, um, there was an EUA, which is an emergency uh, use authorization that came out of the FDA. And um, they were required to use the CDC kit, which had a problem. So there's been a very big delay in getting RT-PCR out. It is now cap you know, available, but not at the, at the levels we'd like to see it. The reverse transcriptase step uses an a, um, a, a enzyme that is hard to get. Uh, there are multiple different types of um, faster um, rapid diagnostic tests that use the same PR, PCR approach, and those will be coming, becoming available or are becoming available. Uh, antibody detection, um, one can draw blood and look to see if there's an immune response to the organism. Um, that is generally thought not to be positive until well into the infectious uh, period. So uh, it becomes positive somewhere between 10 and 20 days. So in terms of determining whether somebody is actually sick and what they're sick due to, or um, identifying uh, people who need to be quarantined, this it's probably not all that useful, but it's a very useful tool for surveillance to find out whether, say, someone who had a cold or, or a flu syndrome uh, two weeks ago, uh, who's a healthcare worker, to see if they actually had been infected. So you can go back and say, people who are in contact with that person should be wary. Or even uh, once, once this uh, test is approved, which it's not yet in the US, even telling people that you know, you're probably immune so you can go back to work and not be as concerned as you might have been otherwise. There's lots of people out there. I'd say the majority of people I know who have um, probably have COVID-19 have not had access to diagnosis. So they're, they're very, very um, concerned as to whether they had it or not. So in terms of protecting themselves for the future. And then finally, there's an antigen detection a tool, which looks at the protein rather than at the, at the nucleic acids. And that allows a faster and cheaper diagnostic test that could be used uh, especially in developing countries where um, we need rapid diagnostic tests that don't require sophisticated laboratories. A number of those, um, there's at least 30 or 40 companies that are making these and they're being uh, validated uh, in a big international um, effort by a whole series of different labs. Um, and uh, WHO and the, uh, the Fund for Innovative New Diagnostics group is helping coordinate and sharing information as to what tests have been validated. So treatment, I mean, we all know there's really not a good uh, treatment at the moment. Um, people who are very sick come to mechanical ventilation. Uh, a number of people have, ECMO, have had to go on to ECMO. ECMO, is, for those who don't know, is extracorporeal mechanical oxygenation, which means basically taking blood out of the body and circulating it through a machine that oxygenates it and then puts it back in the body. Uh, that's what, um, what people who are in septic collapse uh, end up uh, needing. Um, of course, it's even harder to get ECMO machines than it is to get uh, ventilators. So these are um, highly uh, labor tools that are in scarce supply, even in, um, in rich countries in the world, let alone uh, in the rest of the world. You probably have also heard about drug treatments. Um, the one that seems to have the most promise at the moment is remdesivir. Remdesivir is an anti, a broad spectrum antiviral agent. Uh, it has, there's a, a number of clinical trials going on um, even as we speak. Both um, the Brigham and the General uh, are involved in those clinical trials. And uh, remdesivir is I suspect there will be um, reasonable data. Uh, I don't know if it'll be positive or negative, but I think we'll have some a verdict on uh, remdesivir probably in the relatively new, near future, given how many people are needing it and how many people um, are randomized. The company was, um, Gilead was, was uh, letting people use remdesivir for compassionate use, 
but they had so many requests they had to shut down their compassionate use um, program and now it's in clinical trials only which makes me anxious um, to think if it is approved uh, how fast can they scale up the production up and I don't I don't know the answer to that some of the other um, uh, therapeutics that have been looked at are antibodies. So people who have had the disease develop antibodies. And the question is whether either a monoclonal type recombinant antibody or, a, or actually other people's um, uh, sera could be, who have been infected could be used uh, as treatment. Not clear yet, but those are also uh, tools that are in clinical trials. And then because a lot of the, of the um, mortality and morbidity seems to have to do with this uh, cytokine storm and, and a hyper-inflammatory immune response in the lung, uh, host-directed therapies are being considered. And those are, are drugs that dampen down the, the toxic immune response. So some immune response is obviously necessary, but uh, this kind of cytokine storm is, has, it suggests that the, the normal mechanisms that turn off inflammation when it's appropriate to turn it off aren't working. So these drugs, interferon, pegylated interferon, and to some extent the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine that you've been hearing about are anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, they're not, they don't work the same way they say non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories do, but um, there's, that, that's one of the possibilities for how chloroquine may work. We really don't have good data. The one study that um, got a lot of press on hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin seems not to have been a high quality study. So uh, we're not all that um, sure whether that's gonna be a, a useful treatment or not. Okay, I wanna just turn quickly to what you've probably been hearing a lot about uh, transmission dynamics. And as a, as a modeler, somebody put out on Twitter a really um, important comment that people who are not modelers tend to fall into two groups those who are very suspicious of models and think they're worthless, and those who believe everything that every model says. And um, neither of those is really a good position to be in. So models are only as good as uh, the, the parameters that go into them. They should be always looked at with a little bit of suspicion as to what those parameters are and whether they're relevant. Uh, but um, they are useful, and they are useful in, in this, I think, outbreak in terms of kind of trying to predict what might happen and what factors will have an impact. So I'm gonna be really quick about this. I would normally teach this in a, a whole semester long class, but basically the basic reproductive number of an of a infectious organism refers to the number of people that would be infected if you took a single infectious person and stuck them in a completely susceptible population. So we think that those, the, the three things that kind of make up that number or how infectious the organism is, but sort of through, through its natural history. So an infection like measles is super infectious. Um, the, if you come into contact with somebody with measles, um, you have about an 80% chance of being infected. In this case, it's much lower than that, but it's still in the range of about 30% likely, although you know, it varies. K is the contact rate, and by contact rate, we mean the number of people who make, that one might come into contact with for some period of time. So that's really challenging to estimate and we have to kind of back into it. Uh, but um, that, that if you, the, the sort of moral of the story here about the contact rate is the, the denser, the, the, the higher the number of contacts that one has, the more likely, uh, the, the more infectious um, uh, events are going to happen. So if you look at New York, where if you get on the, the subway, you're going to make a lot of contacts. That is part of the reason why the rates of, of uh, disease in New York are so much higher than in say, uh, you know, parts of um, Wyoming. I have no idea what the rates are in Wyoming, but I'm assuming they're low. Uh, another really important issue here is the duration of infectiousness. Uh, and so the longer one is infectious, the more time one has to transmit to other people. And so that is a, each of these parameters is a place where interventions can happen. So what are those interventions? Well, it depends when infectiousness happens. Uh, this is a bit of a complicated um, figure, but take a look at A. Uh, so, and you'll see that we're modeling the, a latent period versus infectious period. So when a person is infected, they, for the first some number of days, they don't, they are not infectious and they're not diseased yet. 
uh, they're brewing infection, their viral loads are rising, but they're not yet sick. They can either become infectious before, at the same time, or after they develop symptoms. So if they, so we call that the period before they become infectious, the latent period, and that could be different from the symptomatic period. And that difference is what makes the difference between how we might uh, control these in infectious diseases. So if somebody becomes symptomatic before they're infectious, then we can find that person as soon as they're ill, we can isolate them, and they shouldn't infect anybody else because they weren't infectious before they, they got sick. So if you really had you know, really good uh, surveillance and found all the ill people and had excellent isolation capabilities, you could stop that infection from spreading. For B, where the symptoms begin at the same time as the infection, you'd have to move pretty fast to get that person isolated in order to prevent any further infection. But what we're really interested in is C, where, where you actually are infectious before you have symptoms. And that's what's happening with this virus. And that's why, probably why it's been so challenging to control. So people are probably infectious for two to three days before they have any symptoms. And because symptoms in uh, young people are often very benign or even non-existent, they can be spreading infection without having that disease uh, event that would tell us this is somebody you should be isolating. So um, it's very much more challenging to, to find those people. And that's where things like uh, quarantine, so finding people who've been infected by a known case or social distancing measures really come into play is when an infectious disease is infectious prior to the onset of symptoms. So just really fast, here's, what, here's how we model this. We, we take, we either do this in a stochastic way where we take, we, we make a big computer program that has thousands of people in it, or we put people into compartments and just run um, uh, rates between compartments. But basically, we, we start out with a single infectious person in a completely susceptible person. We specify a rate of contact and transmis transmission probability, and then we let that infectious person infect people in, in the model. So in this case, R0 is three, because that one infectious person was put into this population and infected three other people. And then um, we assume that people recover. They either, they either die or they recover. And by recovery, we're really thinking of this as an immune um, event where they are now no longer either infectious or capable of being infected. So that might not be true. It might be that people lose their immunity over time or don't have immunity in the first place. But we do think that there's at least temporary immunity for this, for this particular virus. We don't know how long lasting it will be. So then we let these people who've been infected infect other people in the model. Um, the rates that people uh, move from being infectious, susceptible to infectious to recovered are given by the beta, the transmissibility and the contact rate. And then the, the length of time they stay in that infectious um, state is given by the duration of infectiousness. And what that gives you is a epidemic curve. So that, that epidemic curve is in the red. You see that there's a rise in the number of infectious cases over time. It eventually dies out because many people become immune or all the susceptibles are used up. So in this particular case of this kind of toy model, many of the, the, the um, most of the susceptibles are become infectious, become infectious and then infected uh, uh, immune. So over this time period for this, this fake uh, infection that I'm modeling here, the entire population will have been um, uh, infected and become immune. But that's not necessarily the case. That's just the case in a, in a highly infectious uh, agent. So this really is just getting at what I had said before. It's a bit complicated to look at. But in A, in the top one, what what's this is saying is that there's some diseases that are really um, going to be difficult to control. And that's because most of the infectiousness happens prior to the onset of symptoms. So that's true for HIV. So before we had really good testing for HIV and, we're and identifying uh, groups of the population to screen, we really, when people didn't know they had HIV until they were well into the uh, infectious period, often many years. So most of that infectiousness had already taken place. Uh, for, uh, for B, where um, we assume that 
people can be isolated because they're sort of intermediate uh, periods, things like influenza. We can see some um, more control for the outbreak. And for C, where you can do contract tracing, isolation, and we assume it's always effective. Uh, and these are, are diseases where um, there's a, uh, the, where they begin, the infectiousness begins with symptoms. Um, we'll see the, that there's more possibility of control. So that was true of SARS-1. SARS-1, uh, the infectious period didn't really start until people were sick. So we could use isolation as, a, as an effective um, a control measure. And that's part of the reason that SARS-1 actually died out. Okay, uh, what about social distancing? So this is data, as you, you've probably already seen, from a 1918 flu um, in Philadelphia. Uh, no measures were taken to enforce social distancing after flu arrived. Um, in fact, there was a, a St. Patrick's Day parade that um, ended up with a huge, well, it can't be because that was September. I'm sorry, there was a St. Patrick's Day parade, but this is not the data from that. This was the data from later in the year. Um, but without social distancing, we saw a huge spike uh, in cases in St. Louis um, where, where uh, effective social distancing measures went into place very early. We saw a much less um, uh, vigorous uh, epidemic. And this is what you're seeing on the news and hearing about all the time, that you can um, flatten the curve. So what flattening the curve means is that if we reduce the contact rate, that K that was in my, uh, that, that formula, that we can reduce the effective reproductive number. And so each person is going to infect fewer people because they're making fewer contacts. And so what that will do is space out the time uh, that during which the epidemic takes place. And if you kept the contact rate low, it would also mean that you'd reduce the numbers. The reality is we can't social distance forever. So the, the, we have to really consider what happens when we relax social distancing measures. And um, what we expect is that if they're still circulating cases, we'll see a rise in, in the number of, of cases again. But this approach buys us the time to work on treatments, um, to find ventilators and staff, to space out who goes into an ICU, and possibly to develop vaccines. So I want to end um, my little section here with just talking about what's going to be different uh, between low and middle income countries and uh, which are just beginning in many cases to, to feel um, the, this epidemic arriving. Uh, and we don't really know. It's going to, it's going to be uh, something that we'll find out, but we can, we can speculate. So one thing is that um, you know, we do know that weather probably plays some role. Um, we know that it played a role in the 1918 flu and in most seasonal flus. We also know from uh, laboratory experiments that uh, coronaviruses survive longer in colder, drier um, weather, but this is on surfaces. Uh, so we can hope that hot, humid weather will probably reduce environmental survival, but, but we have no solid evidence for this particular coronavirus that that will be true. And we have no idea how much it would have an effect, even if it were true. Secondly, we know that the age distribution is quite different between low and middle income countries and uh, the countries that have already been most affected. So 50% of Africans are under 20 uh, versus about 20% in the US, Western Europe, and China. 5.5% are over 60 in Africa versus 25 to 27% in Europe and 16% in China. So that's all very well, except that there's many other comorbidities that we really don't know much about that uh, pertain to that to those countries. So the most optimistic view would be, oh, you know, we're going to see less severe disease because people are younger. But we then have to think about all the other comorbidities that we are really don't have much of a clue about. So we know that um, cardiovascular disease is much more common than anybody thought it was in low uh, income countries. People just didn't live long enough to develop it or people weren't looking for it, but it certainly exists. We know that um, smoking is common in, in most countries in the world, but we also know that biomass fuel exposure is much more common in low, in, low income countries. So by that, I mean using um, wood or a dung to, to do indoor heating and cooking. 50% of the world has indoor air pollution exposure. Uh, that's probably equivalent to smoking. Um, 
but those are almost all distributed in, in poor countries. So we expect that even in places where people can't afford smoke to smoke or don't smoke, um, that people will have this kind of exposure anyway. And that's particularly true among women who do the cooking. So um, women don't smoke that much in most low-income countries, but they are heavily exposed to biomass fuels. What about HIV, malaria, and other infections? Well, the data on HIV is actually not clear. Uh, there's one cohort that has been followed in China. In Wuhan, uh, a, a group of clinicians got back in touch with their well-defined cohort of HIV patients and looked at how they did during the COVID epidemic. And in that group, they did really no worse um, than the, the general population. But the caveat to that is that everybody in that group was well controlled on antiretrovirals and had uh, um, uh, low viral loads and, and good CD4 counts. So in the context of poor management, we have no idea what will happen. We don't know what will happen with malaria um, and other chronic infections. There is some evidence that soil transmitted infections, uh, uh, helminth infections may actually be protective against these kinds of viral uh, uh, diseases, that they, they kind of dampen the, the hyperinflammatory immune response. And that would be a good thing uh, because soil transmitted helminths are very widely distributed. But again, there's absolutely no data on this so far. What we do know, and I think the most important point is that most of the countries that we're thinking about in Africa uh, and throughout the world have almost no capacity for ICU beds, ventilators, uh, isolated uh, spaces within ICUs, and staff to take care of patients. And so what we know that this um, in-hospital and in-ICU mortality of say 50% uh, in China uh, and probably in Italy uh, people who may get into an ICU and get ventilated will, will probably be closer to 100% um, of those people who, who need an ICU bed because we really just don't have the ICU beds for them. So I'm going to stop there and um, let, let uh, Louise, I think, uh, is that, are you next? Continue. Dr. Murray, thank you so much. That's a fantastic synthesis of a great deal of rapidly evolving information. So, so thank you. Uh, that's the stage perfectly for the rest of this discussion. And we'll move on to, to Elise Ivers. Um, and we'll be discussing how, um, why and where, and how this pandemic will reinforce existing inequalities. Great, thank you. And Megan, if you could unshare your screen, I will be Oh, I'm to... sorry. Great, thanks. Uh, yes, there we go. I'll say this, while, while Elise is, uh, sorry, while Megan's done that, thank you for sending in your questions. They're, they're very provocative questions. Um, and and we'll, we'll be doing that collectively at the end. So certainly feel free to keep them going. So you let me know that you can, you can see everything okay here? Great. So um, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the panel. I think what I'm going to speak about in many ways for this audience is self-evident, um, but I'll take, thanks for indulging me to kind of try to put it together. And it's gonna build a little bit on um, Dr. Murray's last slide. Uh, on how we think that COVID-19 is going to be um, perpetuating inequity in low resource settings. Um, so, so just a quick snapshot, and I'm sure this is already out of date as probably everything I'm saying is like least few hours out of date as of this morning. Um, some of the distribution of cases around the world, what we're seeing is um, where China and Europe and the US are heading into the hopefully the peaks but certainly massive parts of their epidemic many low-income countries are still very in the early stages so in haiti as of early this morning just eight cases confirmed uh, in uganda where i also work 14 cases confirmed and interestingly south africa where we were speaking with a colleague last week when there was 160 cases already a week later over 700 confirmed cases and some places like yemen um, amongst the very few small handful of countries around the world have not reported any cases which presumably in that situation is related to a lack of, of testing. What, what we know from the pandemic diseases that are already going on and in our department many folks have spent their careers studying these diseases but I think a lot of the general population of the world doesn't really realize that we have a lot of pandemics that are ongoing and they've never um, been suppressed. But the, what we know is that discovery and delivery around 
many diseases, they don't fully trickle down. They don't just trickle down without activism and a lot of very proactive um, work to try to get access uh, to, to people about things that we know how to do. Let's look at pneumonia, for example. And pneumonia already separate from COVID-19 is a leading cause of mortality around the world. <clears throat> About 15% of all deaths in under five-year-olds is from pneumonia and strep pneumonia is a really common cause of that. It causes about 18% of severe pneumonia in children, causes about a third of the deaths from pneumonia in children, and through pneumonia and also sepsis and meningitis kills over half a million children a year. But we do have very effective um, prevention for, pneum for pneumococcal disease, for strep pneumo. We have vaccines uh, that have had a major impact for those who can afford to get them. And what we've seen over um, 20 years of really having two companies having a monopoly over the sale of the vaccine, up until 2019, this, these vaccines were really still not affordable for many countries. Uh, in 2019, an Indian company began producing a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which was pre-qualified by the WHO. But two major pharmaceutical companies, despite $50 billion in sales for these vaccines, continue to hold the price quite high for countries. So it does raise a question for us over what is going to happen when we do have vaccines available for COVID. We're going to have to be really proactive about making sure that those are available to everyone who need them. As Dr. Murray mentioned, health systems are not really capable around the world of managing many ordinary, let's say, diseases. This is just a snapshot of diarrheal disease. 1.6 million people die of diarrhea um, every year. It's a major contributor to under five mortality. It's complicated by malnutrition and water insecurity and other factors. But if we take the stark reality that we cannot even prevent and treat a very simple disease, we're going to have to question how we're going to manage um, such a, a rampant pandemic in our um, partner sites and with our colleagues around the world. Human resources for health is a major deficit in health systems globally. Um, although some of this data is a little older, um, the, the WHO predicted a 17 million person shortage in healthcare workers to reach their goals for 2030. A lot of that is um, in nursing. Most of that deficit is in Africa and Southeast Asia. And if you look at this uh, table, and please don't overly think of the precision of it because it's not precise despite the many decimal places, but just to look at the ratios where in Haiti or in Uganda compared to the US, we have such a lower physician and nurse midwife um, density per population than we do within the US. But then what we see is also a heterogeneity in how that's uh, distributed. And in the US, we have some stark figures here which show that um, urban areas are far more um, equipped from a health, a human capacity standpoint in health than rural areas are. And this is gonna have an impact in the US as we deal with our um, pandemic. We're absolutely um, spoiled in Boston for the number of healthcare providers that we have um, per population. So I mentioned um, the, the human resources differences uh, within countries and regions, but we also have heterogeneity in other factors. We know racism is a really important part of uh, health and uh, lack of health. Uh, women, in, women of color in the United States are four times more likely to die uh, of pregnancy than uh, their white counterparts are. We know that American Indian, Alaskan Native health is really underfunded and has um, really put tribal nations in really precarious situation. Uh, they're having and will continue to have a lot of challenges in facing the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we have seen a number of tribes be really proactive and um, declaring states of emergency even before the president of the United States declared a state of emergency. But we also have a lack of good information. This table on the right is from the Indian Health Service um, looking at positive COVID tests from the Indian Health Services, but it, wasn't update, it hasn't been updated for the last few days. Uh, this is only tests that were done within the Indian Health Service. And we know that there's a lot of challenges to actually even accessing that kind of care for many people in the Native American community. We also know that epidemic disease has historically absolutely decimated indigenous people. Um, the great dying occurred uh, after first contact of Europeans in the Americas and resulted in the 
um, removal and death of about 90% of uh, the indigenous population. So not, um, not a good uh, historical note uh, as we think about what might happen in the uh, weeks and months to come. Um, this is a very interesting paper I highly recommend for your late night reading, uh, but very sobering and concerning about the history of epidemic disease uh, in the Americas. Um, Dr. Murray also mentioned this uh, to extent, and I'll expand slightly here, um, as we learn more about the comorbidities that are important for COVID-19, it's, it's well worth pointing out that they are unequally distributed, not just in the United States, but around the world. In the US, um, children with asthma, there's a much higher rate of asthma in black children and Native American children than there are in their white counterparts. Uh, uh, she spoke of uh, tobacco, um, thanks to the wonderful advertising and proactive um, attempts to ensure that low and middle income country inhabitants smoke. Uh, Big Tobacco has ensured that it has 1.1 billion customers and 80% of those are in low and middle income countries. So as the data on active smoking is coming out in terms of risk, whether it's a risk or not, we certainly know that chronic lung disease is a really important consequence of smoking and will certainly put many people at risk around the world because of that. We can also look at diabetes. Um, four, out of five, four out of every five people in the world with diabetes live in a low or middle income country. And again, in, amongst Native Americans, a very high rate of diabetes. So something um, to be concerned about, especially as we look at increasing prices of insulin, uh, for example, and a, and a challenge just to get access to that um, basic care. And in addition to those um, comorbidities, again, as Dr. Um, Murray mentioned, the malnutrition, malnutrition is highly prevalent around the world. We don't really understand how this will impact COVID-19, but we know that malnutrition is a really important part of infectious diseases uh, and how helminth infection or HIV or TB will play out. It's yet, um, yet to be seen, but obviously puts, uh, makes a lot of us quite concerned. Uh, another factor to think about is really testing capacity. So testing capacity is, is very limited for on a normal day in many countries. And a lot of the success in Asia around uh, suppressing virus, the virus transmission for COVID has been um, focused on very aggressive uh, testing. And we have a lot of limitations in laboratory capacity in low resource settings. Structures are over-concentrated in urban areas. In addition to limited testing, the data we're seeing are aggregate data. So we can't even really interrogate right now who's getting tested more than others, um, whether or not it's our rock stars and our pop stars, uh, whether it's women, whether it's people of color. We, we don't really know yet, but we need to start asking for a disaggregation of data so that we can keep an eye uh, on things because we know that uh, if we wait until the end to look back, we, we might... Um, find that the way the testing is uh, rolled out, not just in Massachusetts, but around the world is not uh, equitable. And this snapshot really, again, it's, it's, it's not up to date data because the data is hard to keep up to date. And this, these are official re records that are being reported to our world in data, but I just show it to kind of emphasize that in addition to testing capacity being limited, the testing strategies are really not proactive enough. So if you look in some of the, in Asia, large amounts of testing happening, but at the bottom of the table here, I pulled a couple of low and middle income countries where you can see they're being too um, reactive in testing. And we need to get up to the point, perhaps where Vietnam, uh, where I've heard anecdotes of an uh, aggressive testing strategy. We need to push more so that the countries where that are seem to be early on their epidemic based on confirmed tests are actually pushing more and more to be active in their case finding. We've talked before in other form about the fact that socially distancing is really not materially possible for many people. We have that problem in the US, um, many homeless people. Um, we have that problem in the US uh, for incarcerated people. Just last week, we talked about the possibility of outbreaks in prisons. Over 2 million people in the United States are incarcerated. About 51,000 of them are detained by Customs and Border Protection. And many of them are le legally um, seeking asylum in this country, but um, are being held. And we saw um, this report from just yesterday of an outbreak of COVID-19 in Rikers Island in a prison, which is uh, very serious and will, I'm sure, have very um, terrible consequences unless there's a very proactive intervention. 
We know that epidemics historically have gendered impacts. <clears throat> Excuse me, 70% of workers in the world in the health sphere um, are women. Women do a lot of caregiving at home. Uh, we know that the economic impact of an epidemic is going to be um, gendered. Women are three times more likely to be doing unpaid care work at home. They are more often than men involved in the informal economy. They have less financial resilience. And I think when we look at quote, crowding out of the health system, that happens in epidemics. Maternal mortality is often one of the most vulnerable to a uh, lack of health system capacity. Um, this report from Sierra Leone uh, in 2014 looked at their gendered impacts. Um, more women in Sierra Leone, 56% of confirmed Ebola cases in Sierra Leone were women compared to 43% amongst men, um, something that we should um, think very carefully about. And when we know that outbreaks cried out this overstretched health systems, again, two studies looking uh, at the West African Ebola outbreak outbreak where 28,000 cases of Ebola occurred, about 11,000 deaths. But in addition to that, there were um, 4,000 additional maternal mortalities, 6,500 additional, additional infant deaths, and about 3.5 million um, untreated or undiagnosed cases of uh, childhood malaria. So something that we really have to be concerned about as well. Um, it's virtually impossible to follow the um, recommendations of avoiding COVID-19 in many places, not least of which is the lack of access to safe water and sanitation. Billions of people around the world do not have access to soap at their houses to wash their hands. So we are giving false information if we ask them to wash their hands without providing them the means with which they should be able to do that. The U.S. is no exception to the challenges in water and sanitation. We could uh, read stories from Flint, Michigan. We could look at this story from um, Alabama, rural Alabama, where a small study found um, exposure to hookworm. And this was in part due to the fact that in Alabama, they had made criminal um, prosecutions to folks who had straight pipes for sanitation in, in their uh, homes, criminalizing poverty and worsening people's ability to actually get themselves out of poverty. Anyone who knows me is knows that I'm not going to finish a talk without talking about food insecurity because it's um, relevant for infectious diseases. The um, figure is just from a paper that my colleague Erin Richterman and I wrote looking at um, food insecurity nationally and cholera epidemics. And we found an association um, amongst national food ins insecurity and the incidence of cholera in countries. Uh, the figure also just is to show the intersectionality really of so many of these things that I'm mentioning. Um, it's 820 million people around the world do not have enough food to eat. And in addition to being malnourished when you don't have enough food, food to eat, it drastically impacts your ability to make choices that others might direct you to make. So it is virtually impossible to stay home uh, for prolonged periods of time if you normally eat at the end of your day's work because you have worked. So we need to think about uh, these things as we um, create our solutions. Outbreaks we know also just reinforce the violence of war. The, these maps uh, look at Yemen in 2017 uh, and on the eastern part of the country, on the left-hand side, you see the conflict, front lines, um, war, embargo, uh, famine. And on the right map, you see the incidence of cholera cases. Um, what's striking is that the Western, I'm sorry, I have my um, East and West mixed up. <laughs> the, the Western part of the country is the orange conflict area and the Western part of the incidence map is showing you how the cholera cases are very dense compared to the eastern part of um, the country. Again, just to reflect on the fact that Yemen still has not reported any coronavirus cases, which seems to be um, completely un hard to believe, uh, other than due to the fact that um, testing is not really being possible to do. So I feel like the bad news, um, the bad news doctor, <laughs> but I, I think part of being um, a faculty in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and having the opportunity to work with many of these panelists and also with Partners in Health and many other great implementing organizations over the years uh, without being too naive, I think what to do is we need to believe in what it is possible to do. Um, we've seen many of my colleagues working on issues like 
reducing transmission of cholera in Haiti, delivering hepatitis C treatment in Rwanda, um, you know, being advocates and curing patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis in India, a place where one of the most populous countries in the world where no one thought it would be possible to eliminate smallpox, uh, in countries also where it seemed impossible to um, advance on polio elimination. So I think we have to really um, believe in what's possible to do. And we have to look not only at the fragilities of health systems around the world, but also at some of their strengths and try to use those strengths as we move forward, especially thinking about community-based um, activities, community health workers, engaging community uh, health organizations. The solution to so many of our problems is uh, in the communities where the problems are um, being faced the most. And we have to have the humility to realize that the answers to the problems are not going to be made by those of us in offices on home social, social distancing, but they're going to be made in partnership with people who can offer us really innovative ideas, really thoughtful solutions, and we have to push our resources to them and we have to open the table for their uh, voices in the discussion. So I'm just going to throw a couple of ideas out here in my last slide or so. We, we, we need to rapidly scale up point of care testing and rapid diagnostics so that we can do active case finding. We have to include low resource settings in emergency studies that are, are going on. The WHO has opened a trial that's multinational uh, for in-use drugs and that's, that's promising. But we have to also include uh, researchers from low income countries. We have to get them resources. We have to get them dollars. Um, talent is equally distributed, but resources are not. And and the solution to many of our problems may be found in places where the dollars have just not made it. We have to have radical approaches to um, social support. I really believe we should be releasing low-level offenders from prison, prisoner, from prison, and we definitely should be releasing um, asylum seekers from detention. And we have to make a global commitment that when therapeutics and vaccines become available, that we're going to make sure that everyone has access to them. So I'll end there just to acknowledge everybody who, uh, again, on the panel, who's been an inspiration for many of this and this photo, who's, you can let me know uh, if you're on the line, if you took this photo, because I don't know who took the photo, but it's from um, University Hospital in Mirbalé in Haiti. And in Creole, it says, we're staying at the hospital for you. So stay at home for us and wash your hands. <laughs> so I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Dr. Iris, thank you so much. I mean, having heard you speak brilliantly on this last Thursday, it's amazing how much has already come to pass a week later today with respect to, to prisons. And thank you for starting our discussion of how we can respond effectively to, to flatten the curve and, and help respond to this. And, and Dr. Curry will now continue us in that, in that direction. Um, all right, I'm just gonna try to share my screen. Hold on, sorry, I'm having a share moment. Um, it's gonna be interesting because it's not allowing me to share. Um, so what I can do is, um, if you're just, sorry. That's... Don't worry, take your time. We'll, we'll... All right, thanks. Um, so first of all, I really wanna thank Louise for, um, highlighting I think some very core issues and what I'm just going to do is send my presentation to somebody else who can load it for us. Um, but it, uh, I think that the, this is the key is that we are facing an epidemic where we are all actually vulnerable and every single individual on this earth um, has the ability to be uh, you know subject to COVID um, or to get sick from it. The difference is really going to be, you know, to speak to where Megan started a little bit is what is your, what is kind of your ability uh, to get infected because of the circumstances by which you are um, born into or live in or are stuck in that will really, um, to some degree, determine what your outcome is. And I think that we've seen this, um, you know, throughout time where if you and Paul will, I know, speak about this um, a little bit more, but when you look at previous epidemics, for example, you have um, Ebola, the, the you know mortality rate of Ebola was 90% in um, some parts of the world. And you come to the United States and the mortality drops to you know next to nothing. And it really speaks to the access of, uh, of resources. Um, 
and hopefully my slides will be up shortly. But uh, what I wanted to take a moment to really highlight is just, I guess, the silver lining of COVID um, amid all the risk. Uh, what COVID has really shown us is that we have an opportunity to highlight the power of health to be transformative to human life and to everything that we seek. We live in a country right now that uh, where a president has been prioritizing the economy over human health. And so beyond just the moral argument of the importance of health as a, to create opportunity, the reality is if you want to save the economy, you should be putting a full board massive effort into um, shutting down this pandemic and to prioritizing health and above all. And so I'm, you know, while I live in a world that very much believes in the importance of health because it is fundamental, it is a human right, um, I also try to be pragmatic to think about how do we start to change the arguments for people who maybe pull the levers of power, but don't necessarily see health in the same way that we might um, for many of us on this phone call. And certainly my colleagues and mentors who have just spoken, um, you know, before me. So um, to just open up and, and here come the slides. Thank you, um, Megan Carroll for uh, helping. So if we just start with the next slide. Um, Health is basically security. It's security on a number of different levels. It is global security, national security, security of a community, and individual security, if you can advance. Um, health is integrated into absolutely everything we do or we strive to do. And it is our ability to go to work, it is our ability to care for our families, it is our ability to get up in the morning and to um, be able to participate in life. It is our mental well being. It's our, the calmness with which we can approach our children every day. It is quite literally the things that allow us to not just survive, but to thrive and to function. So when we think about the different levels of security that health can exist on, and I'll ask someone to go to the next slide, please. You can just click through about the next eight slides. This is the start of COVID. So when we think about health as a global security issue, you saw that it started in Wuhan in China, and then it ended up migrating across the world um, with increasing proportions. Um, stop here, please. And what we've ultimately ended up with is a single infection that started in a single community, potentially even just a single market, that has now become a global threat on every single level to every individual and to every sector that we have. And then, so when you think about a perfect storm of health intersecting with a global security issue, we are talking about threats to how countries relate to each other as borders close. We're talking about economic shutdowns, trade agreements that are getting, um, you know, put at test. We have, uh, you know, our security here in the United States for our healthcare providers is being threatened by the fact that we have a trade uh, tear up in place on China that is prohibiting us to be able to mobilize masks in a fast way that we now have to figure out how to change. And so there's a huge illustration of COVID to what it means for our global threat and our ability to operate as a global society and to engage. So the next slide, please. For national security, though, we also know that there's data that supports that you can absolutely wear shorts. Yes, please go outside. Thanks, guys. Um, so it is uh, for national security, we have data now that really supports that a country's security can be uh, threatened by a health issue or not. And so, and our ability to respond to those, those um, threats or health issues can transform how a country can engage. So a white paper came out with the World Bank recently that showed that PEPFAR recipient countries, PEPFAR being the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, it was the multi-billion dollar initiative that came out under a bipartisan leadership back in 2005 and really became transformative in public health because it poured billions of dollars into the epidemic of HIV. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from HIV that we can apply to COVID um, today as well. And in this, what they discovered was that PEPFAR recipient countries saw improved governance, accountability, and political stability when they had the money put in to invest in and strengthen those systems, if you mind clicking. So it showed that since 2004, PEPFAR countries in Sub-Saharan Africa had reduced political instability and violent activity by 40%, compared with only 3% among non-PEPFAR countries in the region. Next slide, please. Um, or next click. 
And so if you look at this data on a graph, as you can see, PEPFAR countries are in blue and non-PEPFAR countries are in red. So PEPFAR recipient countries did better in terms of state regulation, rule of law, decreased corruption, accountability, um, and other aspects of political stability. If you click again. And it just makes sense, because if you think about it, actually, there's a really fundamental issue that if a government fails to provide even basic health needs, it helps support and undermine trust of that government. I think if you look in this country where we're incredibly, I'm having to go back actually, if you look in this country where we're incredibly divided, part of the division I think that we're facing is a sense of chaos that comes from the fact that our government is unable to provide a safety net to all, is unable to ensure protections. We have a higher number of uninsured happening in this country. And if you look at, especially in the COVID response, people are nervous because they don't know where they're gonna be able to turn for care. There's the story that came out of Florida, for example, of a gentleman who did the responsible thing and came back from China, went to the emergency room to get tested for COVID and ended up getting hit with an almost $4,000 bill for doing the right thing. Those kinds of stories and messages are gonna deter people from seeking care, at least in this country. And in other countries, um, a failure to provide services just undermines uh, a faith in government and can build a general sense of distrust. Next slide, please. Community security also matters though. So back in the 1970s, the Health for All movement really advocated for strong primary care systems. These were basic health systems that focused on clean water, sanitation, nutrition, and full engagement of a community in the services that could be provided. The vision was one that you get stronger healthcare if it is community-based, if it is contextual, locally led, with individuals who are thinking about what it means to be affected as that community and where the challenges lie to be able to create better health and can help co-think about and lead on what those solutions are. And you know, a lot of my colleagues on this phone call have been champions of what it means to create community health systems that are vested in the leadership of the local voices who can really help tailor and have ownership over what the right health solutions look like. And it's critically important because when you have a breakdown of community health, psychological well-being goes out um, the door, social cohesion can fall apart. There's an environmental impact of stress and instability that becomes a vicious cycle. And if you look at the HIV epidemic again, um, parents who died of HIV left a generation of children as orphans that grew up in a degree of instability and actually became um, sort of one of the higher rates of the next wave of HIV infections um, because of those social instabilities that helped create an unstable environment and put them more at risk. Stigma certainly can break apart communities. If people are afraid um, of other members of the community, you can get a breakdown within the community as well. Next slide. Individual security, though, is where I also want to focus because when we think about health as a human right, we know that individuals need health. They need to be able to go earn wages. They need to be able to care for their families. They need to not live in fear of what it means to um, wake up every day and, and be at risk from a health standpoint. Uh, Louise did a, an unbelievable job of really outlining some of the ways that individual security is at risk in resource limited settings. And it goes across gender, it goes across culture, it goes across where you live, it's based in poverty. There's a number of different ways that individual security can be at risk. But again, there's data that really supports how health can be critical to individual security. There are personal and household costs that are linked to poor health, for example. Loss of personal productivity, loss of income, either out of pocket to purchase medications, or for example, if you live in Uganda right now and you need to go to an emergency room because you're worried that you're sick, you have to purchase your own gloves upon entry to the emergency room. There's increased out-of-pocket expenses as well if you're participating in bad behavior, like out, you know, excessive alcohol or, or purchase of cigarettes. That can be the difference between paying for food or paying for bad behavior um, or, or harmful behavior. If you could click again, please. And you can click through four times. Um, one of my favorite studies, which is a little bit old, but I think really illustrates the impact of poor health on households and individuals is in Zambia. So a study looked by the UNDP looked at what happened when the main breadwinner of a household in Lusaka died of HIV. 
and found that 67% of households had an 80% loss or decrease in income. 61% of households lost access to housing. 39% of households lost access to running water. And 21% of girls and 17% of boys stopped attending school. The lifelong ramifications of that instability are immense. And that is just from losing a single individual to HIV. Next slide, please. So there are very real challenges when we think about what COVID means globally. And Louise covered some of these. You can go to the next slide. This is just um, based on the uh, Institute of Health Metrics in Seattle. Our world and data pull together just the map of where the global burden of disease is. As you can see, darker red, higher burden of disease, lighter yellow, less burdens of disease. And as you can see, there's a fairly strong geographic concentration of where the burdens of disease are highest. And as Louise noted, uh, sorry, stay back on that slide. Um, as Louise noted, this is, we worry about COVID as a new pandemic that threatens everybody, but there are existing and real epidemics that are happening every day in these places. HIV persists globally, TB persists, you have an unacceptable uh, rates of maternal mortality. We have cardiovascular disease, non-communicable diseases. We have mental health crises happening. We have antimicrobial resistance. So there's an existing and already overwhelming burden of disease in many places that we have to counter. You can go to the next slide, please. Problem is the resources are most, or the resources are least where the burden of disease is often highest. And if you click again, um, which means that the disproportionate burdens of disease tend to be concentrated, if you click again, into a few core places. One, HIV. 97% of those living with HIV reside in low and middle income countries, especially South Sub-Saharan Africa. Non-communicable disease, 80% of those deaths are in low and middle income countries. And 99% of maternal mortality deaths are occurring in resource limited countries. Um, next slide. And, the, um, and this is true in the United States as well. This is a map uh, basically by county of the uh, rates of, non, of uh, cardiovascular disease around the country, and if you click again, and this is the map of poverty. And as you can see, poverty tends to overlay exactly where we are seeing um, some of the highest burdens of disease, which is a marker of the resources available with which to confront that disease. Next. But I'm also want to paint the half full moment here because there is an opportunity in COVID if we choose to have it. We're going to be defined as a generation, as an epoch, based on how we respond in this moment to this pandemic. We have to accept that our lives are irrevocably changed by this, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. If we take a moment and think about how in our response to COVID, we can use it to really springboard health front and center in all of our responses in what we do. And a lot of the efforts that we're trying to do through the program and global public policy and social change at Harvard Medical School is to begin to really try to help elevate some of these policy conversations and to raise the profile of health. And COVID provides us a very important illustration of the fact that as we respond to COVID, we can use this to reinfuse our public health systems double down on prevention and best practices, and stand up those systems that Louise described so well that are critically important, food security, water and sanitation, um, sort of some of the important access points that are critically important to ensuring that people have the opportunity to not only seek health, but to be able to participate in society fully, have access to jobs and other things that create a positive food feedback loop. Next slide, please. When you look at the WHO's health system framework, on the left, you have the system building blocks. These are the pieces the WHO is defined as critically important building blocks for our health system. So service delivery, our ability to actually provide the services that we need that are critically important to care for patients. A health workforce, which is um, essential to being able to deliver those services and to being able to uh, provide the referral network from the community all the way into the hospital and back information, how do we track the data, disaggregate the data of testing to be able to optimize testing to the communities that need it most, for example, medical products, vaccines, and technologies. Every health system in the world, whether in the United States, in Canada, Europe, or Sub-Saharan Africa or Haiti, needs to have access to the products, vaccines, and therapies that are needed to address disease. And if you look historically, you look again at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, for example, 
or you even look in Ebola, right? The, the access to the supportive needs and cares and, um, and medicines needed or you know, the, the kind of ventilators and aspects of critical care that might be needed um, in, an, in an acute Ebola case or in HIV, the access to the FDA approved drugs and antiretrovirals, those have always been introduced first in more resource developed and accessible settings. But if we think about this, we have to think about where the burdens of disease are worst and where we can help deliver those services equitably across the board. Financing. This is going to be the crisis of COVID that it's, it's going to uncover is how do we finance a health system that supports everybody, creates the appropriate safety nets, cares for the people that are needed to be cared for and doesn't have a complete breakdown. And I know that we are really confronting that now as some of the high drivers of economic volume in the health system are you know, being crushed out to deal with the emergency response of COVID. People are worrying about how we're gonna be able to fund our entire system. And leadership and governance matters. I think part of the reason we are in the place we are in today with COVID, we have seen the spread that we have seen globally is because we've had a failure of leadership at the highest levels and a disconnect between the political leadership and understanding health systems and the public health systems that needed to be stood up. And that disconnect is incredibly dangerous and we've seen it um, multiple times across the board um, and in terms of what it can do. But when political leaders are empowered to make smart decisions based on science and data and provide the kind of roadmap and clarity needed, then populations are gonna be much better positioned to be resilient and to respond. And equally, we put the services um, in place that are needed most. And so, for example, if you think about a COVID response right now, if we are going to go into a systemic lockdown as a, as a society, excuse me one moment again, yes. I can't do this right now, my love, okay? In a moment, thank you. Um, so if we are going to make a meaningful response to COVID, and we are going to put a country into a systemic lockdown that is needed, um, and, and to be able to really shut down the level of transmission, then we need to be thinking about what do social services look like for those children, the one in 10 children in New York that are homeless, or for those children that get all their meals at school. How do we ensure that we are able to care for those people as some of the, as some of the kind of stopgap structures we've created fall apart in this moment? But true leadership needs to be able to answer that. And they also need to be able to provide clarity and, 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 the, and honesty that builds the trust and the communication needed. And if you have these six components of the system of the building blocks, you see improved health, you see responsiveness of health systems, social finance, um, social and financial risk protection, improved efficiency, but I would also add you will see, and equity is included in the first one, but you'll see resiliency of health systems as well. And that would be the fifth component I would add. Next slide. What this might look like, and this is from the WHO, so this is their emergency care system framework. If you're gonna really build a strong health system, um, and it, it's built on, you know, and, and Paul often talks about this too, you need a series of things, including systems, which would be indicated in blue, you need the human resources and the people, which are the points in orange, and you need to have the equipment and the supplies that are in green, and all of these have to come together. But this also needs to come together from, from the most farthest stretches of the community and then have a strong linked network into the centralized, um, into sort of like the hospital and the center system. Next slide. Um, so as we, uh, you can pass this one again, actually, sorry. So as we think about this, and just to give one challenge of staffing, for example, when we think about our COVID response, this is true of all of our health systems and building resilient health systems. And this is where we have an opportunity in our COVID response to build resilient health systems that's, that you know, outlast COVID. We know that we have a lack of frontline health professionals and workers to address current needs. There's, for example, current nursing shortages with poor ratios of nurses to patients. It means that patient care is often provided by families in many settings and communities. So you can imagine if you have a COVID positive patient, you don't necessarily want family members being on the front line of caring if you're going to disrupt um, transmission. There's lack of training programs in many places to be able to build the kind of uh, well-distributed, robust health workforce needed uh, to ensure that you have coverage from the last mile all the way into the highest um, levels of care that could be provided. We've had historic brain drain where 
Um, often people have been asked to work in very difficult settings without backup, support, without reimbursement. Um, and as a result, systems have fallen apart as people have left those systems. And so the systems are challenged. So as we think about that underlying problem, when we think about our COVID response, there's an opportunity to step up to each of these things as we respond to COVID. Next slide, please. To give you some sense, this is just a pictorial of the, where the distribution of nurses is globally. Next slide. Doctors, and as you remember from that map, we're talking about healthcare worker shortages that are worse in the places where the burdens of disease are highest and are very at risk. Next slide. There's a leadership gap though that we also have to be thinking about in this moment that we can help close as we think about our COVID response. So a colleague of mine typed in the word HIV to PubMed, looked at the first hundred articles of, um, that popped up in PubMed for, sorry, the, um, for, sorry, the first 300 articles that popped up and looked at the first authors, the person who's writing the paper, generating the questions and really trying to, to think about, you know, what it is that's being studied in HIV in this question. Found that about, if you click again, um, next two more clicks, 48% of people studying HIV and first authors were from North America, 27% were from Europe, and next click please, and only 13% were from Sub-Saharan Africa, whereas you see in the map in red, the greatest concentration of HIV is. And so we know that people who are on the front lines of trying to figure out the solutions are not, um, not necessarily the ones whose ideas, science, and research is being promoted. And in, as we go into a COVID response and we start to do the studies and we start to look at the data, we should be thinking very actively and proactively about how we are engaging our colleagues in these settings who are trying to you know, who are generating this data and are, are living that data every day to put them front and center of the questions that need to be asked, need to be studied, need to be written. Next slide, please. Equally, there's been a traditional leadership gap. So as we've gone through brain drain and some of these, um, and some of these um, sort of the decimation of the health workforce over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a market effort to increase the numbers of community health workers, increasing the access points and the ability to really accompany and care for patients throughout the system. And that scale up is critically important. I would argue we need it in the United States without question. And it's gonna be very important to our social response to COVID for tracking and for being able to identify cases and contain cases around the, around the board. But at the same time, we need to ensure that we are building up the capacity at the level of ministries, of administrative, and for the, for the health professionals to be able to provide the referral network and support to those frontline health workers. Because you can't ask these frontline health workers to be, on, to be caring for patients who end up critically ill or getting very ill and not having somewhere to turn for support. It doesn't do well for morale, it doesn't do well for retention, and it's not necessarily safe for them to constantly put them in situations where they're being asked to you know, care um, for certain patients. And so it's about creating a well-distributed and even network um, that has, a, that has the, the appropriate chains of, um, of referral and support and in the right distribution and in the right numbers. Next slide. Sorry, you can slide through again. So as we think about COVID and what it means to scale up a meaningful community-based COVID surveillance, tracking, screening, and testing, which we should be aspirational to do in every place around the world, and is possible in every place around the world if we're thoughtful, is that whether we're in an urban center or we're in a rural center in a country and we think about how we create um, a system for tracking COVID cases, those networks we create for identifying COVID cases, moving the sicker cases into the hospital or moving them into more high dependency units and critical care are the same networks we can use for primary care, for management of maternal child health, for, for being able to support all those other health problems that are not only gonna continue in the face of COVID, but will continue after we hopefully get control of COVID. So if we're thoughtful and we take the extra mile, or not even mile, but we leverage a little bit extra investment at this time, the investments we make today can be lasting for the long term. HIV was, our response to HIV as we ramped up with ARTs and efforts to treat and to train uh, were unbelievable in terms of the scale, the money and the scope, and they were highly successful for HIV. 
But as Paul and Louise and other colleagues have certainly shown and have, have written about this, is that the investment in HIV when done strategically could actually become powerful for enhancing primary care systems. And what I don't want to see us do is globally, because we are finally, COVID is coming at the size and scale that people are taking this very seriously and thinking about what it means to have a global response to COVID. What I want to make sure we do is that we take these investments and this money for COVID and make sure that we're building these primary care systems at the same time, building the resiliency for the long term and taking the opportunity and the mobilization of resources, attention, and people caring about this suddenly from all levers of power and economic strata to make the investments in the most vulnerable places in ways that can be lasting, durable, and resilient um, for years to come. Next slide. This is important because we're in an epidemiological shift. When you look at the top 10 causes of death in low-income countries, and this is from 2016, uh, you know, low respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, uh, sort of the, the infectious diseases remain very prominent. And COVID is another infectious disease. So we can think about how we put these systems together again to reduce that level of infectious disease. But on the rise is the cardiovascular disease, strokes, hypertension, diabetes, malignancies, chronic pulmonary diseases that we're also going to have to confront. And so as we're addressing respiratory disease and COVID, for example, we can use the teaching and training to also begin to broaden that differential and understanding of some of these other aspects of disease. Um, COVID, as we know, can cause in when people get acutely ill, can cause cardiovascular collapse. It's obviously a respiratory disease with a viral pneumonia, but it goes on to lead to ARDS and other um, outcomes that can be more chronic. So there's ability to integrate, again, a COVID response to responding to what is the changing, evolving, and existing burdens of disease today and the pathophysiology of those burdens. Next, please. We also have to be thoughtful though about what are the existing gaps in best practices. So we know that there are bundles and protocols that have frequently been developed in resource rich countries that may not always be adaptable to resource limited settings. So when we think about uh, things like sepsis, for example, the, the surviving sepsis guidelines that were issued in 2016 are great for managing septic disease in resource, um, you know, in, in resource uh, sort of more resource rich countries. But it doesn't include guidelines on how to manage sepsis from um, various pathogens that are very prominent in resource limited settings. Next slide. So when we think about what some of these guidelines are, we do want to think about creating, and as we think about what our COVID guidelines are again, we want to be making sure that we're adapting them to settings, building case guidelines in places that there aren't testing, and thinking logically about how we, we, we create some of these guidelines, protocols, and bundles in the COVID response that are appropriate to these settings and again can help address disease burden even after COVID um, is, is resolved. Uh, next slide. Just to give an example, and you can click twice more please, that will be very pertinent here for COVID. Um, colleagues of ours, Beth Riviello and others, uh, working with our colleagues in Rwanda, helped basically identify using a validated study done by a very prominent pulmonologist, critical care doctor in France, Daniel Lichtenstein, who uses only ultrasound basically to identify and stratify uh, lung pathology, um, be it pneumonia, ARDS, or, um, ARDS or uh, pulmonary edema. And he used basically lung ultrasound to identify criteria to establish whether you have ARDS from ultrasound. And recognizing that mechanical ventilation may not be um, adaptable or readily available in many of these settings, uh, Louise showed some of the ICU bed ratios that we see. Um, Beth Riviello and colleagues in Rwanda helped identify a modification of the Berlin criteria for ARDS, which is based on requiring positive pressure ventilation and intubation. And so what they did was they recognized there's a challenge, and it also requires a, a, a blood gas. So recognizing the scarcity of blood gas diagnostics, the scarcity of mechanical ventilation, scarcity of other diagnostics, um, they created the Kigali modification of Berlin, which was defining as worsening lung status over one week of insult using oxygen saturation to FiO2 ratio of less than 315. Um, there's no PEEP requirement, just taking that away and finding bilateral opacities not explained by effusions, collapse, or nodules on chest x-ray or ultrasound. 
And creating this kind of modification can be very important to thinking about how you use limited resources and how you're going to manage patients for fluid management or for other things. And for diagnosing a patient, for example, with what you think is a case identify of COVID versus what's a bacterial pneumonia or some other cause. And so being able to have these kinds of appropriate bundles are gonna be critically important. But this Kigali modification will far outlast COVID. It's a powerful tool that we can use in clinical settings um, around the world. Next, please. Finally, I just think there's an opportunity for us to really think about what it means to build a safety net for our population. When you look at the United States, we're one of the only countries that has no full system or no truly public health safety net that covers all populations. We have one of the highest percentages of uninsured um, for countries within our GDP around the world um, or within our sort of strata. And when we think about what this means to respond to COVID, this is really gonna be about standing up a strong public health system, strong safety nets for those that are the most vulnerable, and being able to support people both socially as well as clinically through this moment, creating the protocols and bundles that can be used in all settings and putting in place the social protections that go forward. Building a public health system, a social safety net, and a clinical system that can deliver top level care and respond to the disease burden we're facing on this will far outlast this epidemic if we do it right and we do it strategically. Next slide. So thank you very much for your time and I'm incredibly honored to join uh, this particular group of panelists who I learn from constantly and every day. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Curry, for yet another powerful talk, uh, which really showed us what, what's at stake here. Uh, as well as the opportunities for not just improved universal health coverage, but for universal health care as well. Thank you. And, and now we'll talk, turn to Dr. Farmer, who will serve as both discussant, will also apply lessons learned from already addressed pandemics to what we are attempting to address today. Dr. Farmer. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you um, for organizing this, but thank you uh, to my colleagues who are just a fantastic reminder of uh, how, how lucky we are to work together, even in difficult times. Um, as you said at the beginning, Scott, by the way, I have seven pages of notes, so I'm going to not look at them when I can avoid it and try to think about the, the big picture. Um, but as you said in launching this, this question of who gets sick and why and who is spared and who has a complication or dies and who does not is spared, these are really for at least two or three centuries been at the heart of social medicine. And uh, as, as we heard in these presentations, uh, this approach, the social medicine approach is, is, uh, is more important than ever. And that's true whether you're a modeler epidemiologist, infectious disease doctor, whether you're a infectious disease doctor, a trialist, or critical care doctor, or an internist historian, the specificity is informing uh, the, uh, the conclusions that we can draw. And let me just go into some discussion of uh, what the points made by our, our speakers and colleagues. Um, nowhere was this more clear than, than in hearing uh, Megan Murray take us um, from the general question, you know, about who lives, who dies, who gets sick, who's spared. Um, and, and there are other ways to, to ask that question, uh, which she she, she, did a number, she used a number of complementary frameworks. For example, can we identify and then rank uh, the factors, biosocial factors, and again, that is meant to be an inclusive rubric, can we identify and rank the forces propelling uh, this epidemic forward or retard it, um, or retarding it, right? And, and modelers are using different terms and uh, ideas, but um, the generality of a model, which is its, uh, it, its most prized aspect, that it's meant to be generalizable, that's a, a point about models in general, its, uh, its most prized aspect is endlessly informed or should be by the specificity that we're getting from real world experience. Um, and that's often clinical, sometimes research. And she gave examples that extended um, all the way from an understanding of symptoms and signs and symptoms 
to an evolving understanding of pathophysiology, diagnostics. I mean, who among us thought a couple of months ago or three months ago that that uh, a portable CT would be um, would eclipse some other diagnostic methods? Um, and uh, and then uh, back to this uh, general point, um, which you know, in fact, if I look at my colleagues. Uh, level of, I have a diagnostic test for their level of grumpiness. Well, you guys all have low grumpy titers now, it seems to me. Um, but each of you commented on, you know, whether or not you were being bad news bears. And let me just uh, comment on how it played out with the, the three of our presenters. As Megan pointed out, a decrease in case fatality rate or case fatality ratio um, is, is going to be seen in epi any epidemic. But it has been quite rapid in specific contexts, like the decrease in case fatality that, that uh, occurred really over a very short amount of time in China uh, or in places where it uh, did not spike but remained low. Uh, a student of, uh, an undergraduate student of ours, when we were talking about variation in case fatality rate, I never forget. Uh, what one of the students said, what does that mean when you see such variable case fatality or variable outcomes? In the 19th century, and for some people well into this one, we would use default explanations that are either about the host or the pathogen, right? So racial disparities in the 19th century were defined radically in, in different uh, a manner. But what this student said on uh, his only comment on variable case fatality rate was that means there's a lot of room for improvement. And I, I, that is the take home message for me, regardless of how bad news bears the presentations may have seen, is that in every instance we have a lot of room uh, for improvement. And um, another point that, that comes out in all of the presentations that is worth underlining in, in a social medicine discussion are reasons that do not explain the drop or changes in case fatality. One thing that we might as well get out here in front of our historic, historian colleagues is case fatality rates have not declined or remained low because of specific preventives or therapies. Right? We don't have specific therapies. We have some specific diagnostics. We have specific um, preventives in the work. We're doing trials of specific therapies, antivirals particularly. Um, but we, we cannot explain anything that's happened so far, I don't think, by invoking specific therapies. Why is this important? Well, I mean, we should ask you, Scott, to comment on this, uh, or David, but um, we we see therapeutic nihilism or therapeutic nihilism um, emerge and decline at various times and places over the years, right? So in the late 19th century, according to one of Scott's book, books, uh, there was a rise in, or a decline in therapeutic nihilism with the rise of specific therapies. These were not anti oral antibacterials, they were, um, serotherapies, antibody therapies. Uh, they were specific, but they were not the ones that would rise a few decades later um, with uh, oral and specific antibacterials and antivirals would happen later. So this is also what we're hearing described now. Um, by the way, the therapeutic nihilism that he was describing for the late 19th century uh, in Europe and across the pond over here um, was pretty different from the PTSD inducing therapeutic nihilism that has marked many of us. And that would be uh, what we saw and was discussed most by, um, by uh, Louise and by Vanessa, which is therapeutic nihilism applied on behalf of other people who are mostly living in poverty and are mostly people of color. That's what we saw around and you know, just go back date by date. You can look at anti. Uh, you can look at our cynicals. You can look at uh, efforts to combat 
trypanosomiasis with therapies. You can look at AIDS in that period between the development of effective suppressive therapy. And now you can look at Gene and everybody's work on non-communicable diseases where there is in the global political economy some effective and specific therapy, but it's not available to those shut out, right? So resisting that therapeutic nihilism by doing what Vanessa did, which was to talk about oxygen, oxygen concentrators, vents, advanced nursing care, the staff stuff, space and systems that we need, we have to uh, keep contesting that therapeutic nihilism because right now at a time when there are no specific therapies or preventives and we're seeing such radically disparate outcomes and risk is a reminder that we do have tools at our disposal even without the specifics. Now, unlike what, what I think we saw well, maybe there's some similarities, but in addition to therapeutic nihilism, um, the idea, look, there's nothing we can do. This person is already sick with a dread disease already at risk um, of, of, of dying. In addition to therapeutic nihilism, we've clearly encountered uh, some containment nihilism as well, right? Um, I can't tell you how many uh, conversations I've had with Jim Kim uh, in the last month in which he is bemoaning uh, the containment nihilism where people are saying, well, it's too late. We can only do uh, mitigation, uh, our own social distancing. It's too late for stern containment me measures. And you've all heard this. You're watching the same uh, news channel I am or reading the same newspapers. Um, and, and what we have seen, um, is the need to resist both kinds of nihilism or nihilism, the therapeutic and containment. Um, clearly, we are not able to explain such dramatic variation um, from province to province or nation state to nation state. We can't really uh, I explain it uh, by using any kind of essentialism that, about, that is about the host or the, the pathogen, right? Um, it really has to do with the social responses to the disease, which is one of the reasons we wanted to do a social medicine response to COVID endeavor. Now, I'm using uh, Megan's, uh, Megan's introductory comments, which were extremely helpful, Megan. I, 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 um, I, could, I, could, well, I never watch stuff again, but I'm going to watch your, all these presentations again. But there was something very uncharacteristic of Megan in her presentation, and that was an exclamation point. I don't think I've ever seen Megan put an exclamation point in a presentation or a paper. Uh, and maybe her new book on epidemics will have exclamation points. I doubt it. But it was, it was an exclamation point around the word, after the word capacity, and, uh, and it was, of course, followed by uh, Louise. Uh, it was kind of a perfect segue. I just want to mention uh, one little specificity, and I'll be going back and forth as Scott has invited me to talk about other epidemics. But, you know, when we talk, uh, when we talk about 1918 as the big one um, and the seasonality of influenza, uh, how many people have asked those of us on this, um, whatever we're on, Zoom, uh, well, when it gets warmer, will this go away? And then, of course, we've had to hem and haw and say we don't know, and people are inside more and crowded more when it's cold, et cetera, et cetera. But in 1918, um, in the third wave of influenza, the one that hit the continent of Africa, I think a lot of historians would agree that they can identify the introduction. I don't know if it's a lot, but there is an argument that we can identify the introduction of the influenza, mutant influenza strain, um, with a certain ship, um, a, this is at the end of the war, it was a convert, converted uh, merchant ship that had become a, this is the HMS Mantua, 600 feet long almost, had hundreds of crew, and the, 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 the ship left in early August, left Plymouth in the UK to serve to guard a convoy um, headed towards Freetown, Sierra Leone, which was amazingly enough, the largest mid-Atlantic port of the British Empire. 
and there was on board a number of cases and you know you, the, the ship's log has been declassified so you can actually you know read um uh read what what happened or what they say happened which is different from what had been in historians accounts anyway it hit um freetown in august which you know all across the equatorial zones it's a pretty hot time of year so um and it exploded like a bomb across all of the port cities of Africa and then went inland through rail and old connections. All this happened in August and September within a month after the uh, coaling of the HMS uh, Mantua, which again departed for Plymouth, within a month, 4% of Freetown's citizens were dead. And it wasn't that different in Lagos and Accra and Durban, and again, whether temperate or equatorial, you know, the, the, that's one lesson that we shouldn't, you know, be too confident about containment or therapeutic nihilism uh, as the, if there's a retreat and if, it, if, if COVID is withdrawn. Back to Louise's comments on capacity. I just want to say, Louise, I found your, your presentation not to be well-worn material at all. I thought it was not only very fresh, but really refreshing and a, and a great way to take stock of where we are right now. It, it, of course, is also back to the bad news bears. I assume that was a movie that made it across the pond to Dublin as well. No, never mind. It's an Americanism, bad news bears. Um, it was a pretty a tough reminder of uh, but a necessary one of the failure of trickle-down uh, logic in general to distribute. And this is something I think Vanessa really underlined beautifully uh, throughout her presentation. This is not going to work. Um, we don't have example examples that it will work. Uh, I mean, we have some inspiring examples that we can make things less bad. PEPFAR is the one that Vanessa and many of us use, but we are, there's no way that when we have the development of specific, as opposed to general preventives, diagnostics, and therapies, there's no evidence that we will not have to struggle valiantly and collectively to make sure that these get to where they need to go. And that's true uh, looking at the urban-rural divide in the United States, uh, and it's true using the always unexamined and de facto unit of analysis that's crept into our discussion more than it has crept into the microbes, and that is the nation state, right? So we don't have evidence uh, that we will not have to struggle to fight the, to have these specific therapeutics and preventives rolled out in a better way than anything we can point to in the historical record. Um, Louise uh, went through let what we might as well call some of the pre-existing social conditions. Um, does that strike you as okay, Louise? Pre-existing social condi conditions. Um, the epidemic of incarceration that you mentioned, the urban versus rural splits that you also brought up, the, the ongoing uh, and changing problem of racism and how it gets in the body and how it gets in the body of our response. Uh, these Pre-existing social conditions cannot, of course, be untied from pre-existing conditions like asthma as well. And again, Louise, I thought that was just artfully done. And uh, I'm very grateful when you use uh, expressions like, you know, materially impossible. We have to be cognizant of the material impossibility uh, of following some of these more stringent recommendations around social distancing or it, it just, uh, it, it, it's gonna vary significantly from time to time and place to place. I mean, I, I was speaking with some colleagues of mine today, academic colleagues, and you know, it, it did not seem to me absurd at all that in this meeting uh, um, that people were comparing notes on how best to collect takeout, right? Or, you know, but there's lots of parts of the world where there is no Amazon Prime and there is no FedEx or, you know, it's not going to be, you know, these are the situations that Louise brought out. Um, you know, it, it's, it is typical of a day like this that we would have, I would go from hearing 
my colleagues and friends talk about the best way to get takeout to Louise talking about the persistent problem of food insecurity and hunger. And I think that was another reminder, Louise, that we just need to embrace this identity of social medicine regardless of how we come at this because we, uh, all of us, regardless of our disciplinary training or clinical engagements, uh, need to understand context. And context is what's around us uh, and also what has happened before. That is, it's, it's a broader context than we can see with our own eyes or ethnographically, but it's also historically given. Um, and the discussions of war uh, and cholera uh, in Yemen are, of course, um, making many of us think about, you know, why is it that Ebola spread so much in those three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, or in, later in Eastern Congo, and, and not elsewhere? Um, and that was, well, those places have been laid low by a decade-long war in recent past, just as Yemen has been in, in recent months. So that's what I meant, Louise, about the bad news bears. I will send you a reference to the film. Uh, um, did I get the name of the film right? Um, Absolutely. I, I can't say that I've ever seen it, but it has a cute title. Um, so you are not a bad news bear, Louise, and neither is Megan, and neither is Vanessa. It's just there's a lot of bad news that, that is worth sharing so that we can do a better job. One of the weirdest things, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to switch on, switch back to Vanessa's comments. One of the weirdest things has been hearing the president of this republic kind of sound a little bit like an, a radical 19th century political economist like Marx, right? So when, when, when someone says, we have to be careful that the cure is not worse than the disease, you know, if, that, if Leon Eisenberg were saying that, we would nod, right, and say, good point, right? People need their jobs, they need to go to work, they don't have Amazon Prime, and they're not arguing about how best safely to have their takeout delivered. And if we want to, uh, answer um, any suggestions that we ease up on uh, containment and mitigation by Easter, if we want to answer that in the way that seems most fitting for us who can shelter in place, then we really do have to keep thinking about the material impossibility of some of the, these approaches for many. And I'm not even getting to psychological incapacity to shelter in place and not see other humans. Um, I'm just talking about where, when and where it's not possible. And Vanessa, I, I just wanna thank you for not giving up on the um, example of PEPFAR. Um, you know, when we stop and, and you said, this is gonna be an epic defining uh, time for us, I, I believe it. Uh, and I think looking back on effective, and, I, and I'll stop very shortly, effective interventions uh, has been really an important thing to do. Um, the, the case fatality rate, and just to make one last point about Vanessa's silver lining um, comments, um, again, she gets the Bad News Bears conference, reference, I think. Um, you know, this is good news, right? All of this has a good side. Case fatality rates are varied. Well, that means there's more than we can do. It is possible to see uh, something very different from Northern Italy, you know, in South Korea. That's good news. That means human intervention can do that. It is possible to see the silver lining that you discern looking forward. And that is uh, this pandemic has to be a catalyst for progressive social change. Now, did we see that after Ebola in West Africa? No, we did not. We, we never saw the progressive social change that would make it easier to avoid a pandemic like that one or an epidemic like that one or improve absolutely obliterated uh, health systems that were flattened because the curve wasn't flattened and because of war. And you point out that we need trust. And again, I would just add one thing and then uh, close, is that trust uh, is also a question of what is materially possible and impossible. 
if people do not have trust in the healthcare system, then they will avoid it. If people do not have trust in the social security or job security system, then they, um, you know, they, they will reflect that lack of, of trust in whatever is called the system. And uh, I just wanna say that these presentations are for me a, a reminder of why it is really important to have social, to have this home identity of social medicine and to, and to thank you, uh, all of you for um, the work that you're doing to make this matter in a sense of finding that silver lining and, and doing uh, things differently the next time around. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Paul, for, for, for putting that all together so, so beautifully. It's, and thank you to, to everyone. This, this was a, a remarkable panel. It's 2.57 now. Can the four of you stick around for a little bit longer for, for a few questions? Okay, great. Well, I Paul, to, I think you're muted. Yeah, no, I have, I, have, I have another 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm Great, good. great. So, so, so we, uh, um, predictably, we had a number of fantastic questions. Um, I'll do just a couple here and throw them out to whoever wants to take these. One, one came from a representative of a philanthropic foundation. Uh, we had well over 300 online attendees to, to, to this um, symposium. And the question was, what kinds of solutions can we not count on pharmaceutical companies and venture capitalists to investigate? What kind of solutions should philanthropy focus on at, at, at this time? I think one thing that I might offer and, you know, just looking at the question, um, Raj Punjabi asked, I think, a, a very important question, too, which is, um, which dovetails to this in a moment, which is that, you know, there will be an excess mortality if we shift all our resources to COVID. And this was the point I actually was trying to make. If we end up shifting all of our resources just to a targeted COVID response. We will see an excess mortality and everything else. And here's the opportunity, right? is to go and put in the fundamentals that also help us respond to COVID. And that also can help us respond to, you know, the babies being born and the other vulnerabilities in the health system that can be seen. And I think these two things can be done at once. And venture capitalists are gonna be looking for a drug that they can, or a ventilator that can be scaled and, you know, sold. They're gonna be looking for, the drug that can go to scale and be the lifesaver that can drive their stock up. They're going to be looking for something that is the silver bullet that creates an economic investment return and primacy in an economic market. We live in a world where economics have been the bottom line. We have moved away from a fundamental investment in what it means to have human well-being, right? The ability for us to actually be human and all of that richness and complexity to be have good mental health, to have time with our families, to have strong health systems that maybe don't necessarily return a huge economic return on the stock market, but actually create a better, more functional, more humane, equitable society. And those are not the places that VCs and pharmaceutical companies are gonna be meaningfully investing in right now, because they're not designed to do that. But philanthropy can be transformative here. Because there is a great power of philanthropists to drive agendas. And, you know, you have to be responsible with that to be very candid as well. Because the priorities you set, which your money can and, and ability to, you know, can help drive that agenda. But I would argue now is the time for us to do what we have never really meaningfully done before, which is to stand up strong, robust, well-designed health systems that reach deep to the last mile and in the community refer well into the hospital, have the people to power it, because technology is wonderful, but it's only as strong as the people available to use it, apply it, and find where to leverage it. You know, to, and to put the equipment in those people's hands so they can actually practice what they train. And if we make that kind of meaningful investment, we can identify COVID, we can isolate, we can test, we can manage people when they get sick with it, but we can also identify the woman with the ruptured uterus, we can identify the cerebral malaria. We can you know, stop the ongoing outbreaks that happen elsewhere. And I think that we know this is, this is possible. Um, you know, there are some lessons learned of where this is possible if we do it well, and they've been done in a microcosm. So for example, if you look at Uganda, Uganda 
has had its share of hemorrhagic fever, not at the scale and scope of West Africa, but enough little boluses of outbreaks that they've scaled up their epidemiological surveillance and response system. It's only one part of their health system, but they, they did all the pieces they needed. Uganda now has, and I think it's 14 cases, but they identified those cases basically upon presentation got a test result in three hours and quarantined an entire plane worth of people and then announced they were going to implement social distancing and put all these pieces in place. It's an example where previous lessons and putting in the investment has actually endured and been resilient to the next thing. We have the ability, if we challenge ourselves and decide we're, we're going to rise to this moment, to be transformative in a way that will far outlast this epidemic and will not only address this epidemic, but will be able to create the idealized systems we need in these places. Investing in paying community health workers, creating the health professionals that provide their backup and support, putting the right equipment in. But that's where philanthropy can be incredibly powerful, is to see where, not, where we have not spent enough time and focus and to unlock and unleash that potential in a way that is enduring, holistic, and is willing to do this in a very big picture, time intensive, yeah. labor intensive way, because everybody on this phone, Raj, others who are on this pan, you know, are listening today, are all prepared to help do that if we're empowered to do it, as well as our partners who want that. No, I, I just, uh, I, first of all, that was incredibly lucid, Vanessa, and, and a great challenge. And, you know, when we say philanthropy, we have a lot of reason as, as a collective, and I, I don't know who's online, but um, as a collective, we have a lot of reason to be grateful to philanthropy because that's how we've done all of our pivots. You know, if, if Megan during the Ebola epidemic says, okay, I'm going to drop, I'm going to stop doing my NIH research to do a rapid evaluation of a rapid diagnosis, di diagnostic, a rapid test in the middle of an Ebola epidemic, in the middle of an Ebola treatment unit, if she's going to do that, it's because, you know, we had friends who will support us, this, you know, and that us could be Last Mile Health, Partners in Health, SEED, but also this department. Uh, that, that's why we can do it. And, you know, so I would just add to that plea that our friends in philanthropy, uh, you know, it's going to sound weird, but, you, you know, trust us to try and steer, uh, steer this ship you know, of uh, responding to an emergency w without steering away from our other obligations. I, I mean, two days ago, one of our closest colleagues who runs the cancer program in, in Mirbalé, she was the victim of a carjacking and shot in the chest, right? And if we had closed down University Hospital because of, we didn't have philanthropic support, or we didn't have, you know, the surgeons and staff and the nurses on call and the blood banked, you know, she wouldn't be with us, you know, if we didn't have an ambulance system. So that, that's another area where I would just like to say to any philanthropist listening, please, you know, keep in mind how difficult it is to put together a proposal with key performance indicators and outcomes and metrics that everybody in conventional philanthropy is going to love when we also have to remember we need emergency services, we can't let women not have assisted childbirths during an Ebola epidemic. We can't have our oncology directors take a bullet to the chest and not know that the surgical team is, and blood are gonna be waiting for them. And thank God, you know, she's gonna make it. But that's only because we did not, you know, turn away from provision of emergency medical services to focusing just on containment for COVID. Sorry for the yeah, anecdote. I, I, Paul, you raise a really good point that I, I would say. I mean, I, I think, um, and it is, it's true. It's just also to say thank you because the work that we're doing at Seed Global Health in terms of health system strengthening and building some of this has only been empowered by philanthropists like you who see the long-term vision. And I think that, again, all of our, my colleagues in here would, would say the same. So it's not to say that you haven't been doing that, but it's again to say herein lies the opportunity. And we welcome that support and help because all of us are on the front lines. Um, you know, Louise in Haiti and Uganda, Seed Global Health in Uganda, Zambia, um, and Malawi and Sierra Leone and elsewhere, and, and 
others in the phone. We're all trying to support these systems and have been for years. And we have an opportunity now to mobilize at a new level that we've never really done before uh, to be transformative. And that's the exciting thing. And that's where the world can be irrevocably changed in a way that's good. I just, I just want to also add to that. <clears throat> I think, you know, we, many of us have been hoping for a global fund for health systems. I mean, if you look at the, if you looked at the opportunities that Vanessa discussed around PEPFAR and the global fund for AIDS, TB and malaria, some of the successes of those. And if you thought about the opportunity now to create a, a fund for health systems that would allow that kind of, um, lateral investments that would be enduring beyond this particular pandemic. I think if there was ever a time for that, the time is now. And I also will just add in terms of philanthropy, I mean, I think we especially need philanthropy when markets fail. And, um, you know, I'm not an economist and I know about the stock market from the movie Trading Places, Paul, in case you um, are, want to trade movie stories. But, um, Markets fail the poorest inhabitants of this planet all the time, and um, they're failing them in their, you know, the markets are failing on the delivery of therapeutics and vaccinations. And so what we see for cholera vaccine or even for the pneumococcal vaccine that I mentioned, that it's philanthropy through the Gates Foundation in particular that has invested in the scale up and the transfer of that technology for <clears throat> for other countries to be able to compete against the big um, for-profit institution. Thank you. So uh, unfortunately, it's almost 3.10 now, so I do think we have, we have, we have, we have to stop. Um, thank you all, all of you for extending from far beyond COVID-19 to, to global concerns around coverage and care and how we can leverage this for, to, to strengthen the systems moving forward. Um, just a remarkable panel that so grateful to have you as colleagues who, who can educate all of us. Um, um, so, you know, if we were in person, we would all clap at this point and thank you. Uh, I want to point to uh, upcoming talks. Uh, Bepi Raviolo will be speaking next week on COVID-19 and mental health. David Jones will be speaking the following week on COVID-19 and history and historiography and lessons learned from history. Um, Gene Richardson will be reporting from, from Ethiopia. And thereafter, um, Arthur Kleinman will be speaking on COVID-19 and social isolation and the lived experience of COVID-19 from, from everyone involved. So we, we, we I think, a lot to learn. Um, grateful to have everyone here uh, as colleagues as we all move forward together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott, for bringing us together and, and thank all those who organized this. <laughs>